Hello investors, I um, just uh, the past week just read uh, an amazing book, um, you can find it for free online uh, and it's called um, Hedge Fund Market Wizards and it's written by um, Jack Swager, I'll put uh, the link in my um, comments uh, on the YouTube, uh, below the YouTube video. I'll put the link to the book uh, where you can f read it for free and um, it's uh, it's really uh, I, I can say that for me uh, in the investment category books it's in my top three list uh, so two books that impacted me most before was uh, first the book from uh, Mark Faber Faber Tomorrow's Gold that I read around in 2005 and it was published in 2003 uh, that really impacted me and the second book that impacted me was the book from Harry Brown Fail Safe Investing um, and his other book in relation to that um, which uh, th that, uh, the other book from Harry Brown was um, uh, how um, every investment strategy goes wrong basically I don't know the exact title but I found it very good and uh, then today I've read uh, Hedge Fund Market Wizards by Jack Swager and uh, uh, for me this really um, impacted me a lot um, uh, in how I look at uh, investing. And um, yeah, what I've learned today in that book is that actually it is possible to invest um, uh, profitably many hedge fund managers have proven to be able to do so and um, the uh, basically my investment process went uh, as follows my first book from Mark Faber Tomorrow's Gold learned me that if you have the right asset and you jump on the right asset and you stay with that for uh, a decade uh, that's the way to make money uh, but then came the book from uh, Harry Brown um, uh, who, who said that actually it's very hard to do that and uh, most people fail and actually it isn't worth uh, uh, well you can try it but you will likely fail huh? um, and this impacted me hence why I, I started promoting the permanent portfolio above investing in, in gold and silver um, but today after having uh, had a few years of experience with the permanent portfolio and also uh, having realized that actually the, re the real returns are very low, too low for me and uh, also realizing that many of the things that Harry Brown has said are not true um, but it's partly true. <laughs> it is true that it is very difficult to make money via investing uh, you need first of all a lot of capital which most people don't have huh? and secondly you really need to outperform all the others and, uh, and in order to do so you really need uh, to have an edge huh? to, to, to so but it is not true as Harry Brown said that it is a futile effort huh? he didn't say that literally but basically that's his message huh? forget about it just do the permanent portfolio and don't he, he always allowed space for speculations in the variable portfolio but at the same time he would say that uh, actually all those that succeed in making money via speculations is just be, basically being lucky and that was what Harry Brown said. Today I've learned that's not true. Huh? Uh, for example in this recent book uh, uh, Market Wizards by Jack Swager he really goes into that. Uh, this book is actually uh, uh, 10 to, to 20 interviews with successful hedge fund managers and that means managers that have strongly outperformed the permanent portfolio who have had uh, uh, over a long uh, uh, period eh, so that means more than 10 years um, have had a performance of uh, minimum 15, 15 percent per year on average um, so 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 there are uh, 
just in that book, uh, uh, 20, 20 managers that do so and that are being interviewed how they did that. Huh? And, um, and one, for, one of them, for example, is um, Uh, uh, his name is slipping, um, Toddler, just a moment. So I have his name, eh? it's Edward Torp, and I think uh, that's uh, hedge fund manager Torp is T-H-O-R-P. Um, so uh, this, this person, this man who still lives today, um, has had a track record that's um, just amazing. Eh? Um, I think just, I'm, I'm just uh, by hat here, eh, but from uh, the track record of his fund was uh, a period of uh, somewhere around 300 months. And of those 300 months, only three were negative. And those three months were negative by less than 1%. Yeah. So how is that possible, such a track record? Because statistically, even if you would say, okay, he was just lucky, well, even then it's not possible because you can not be so lucky uh, to have such a track record uh, unless all people on planet Earth, eh, of the six billion people that live on planet Earth, if all of them would be hedge fund managers, then still none of them would have such an amazing track record just by sheer luck eh? because it's so excep exceptionally good. So how, does he do, how did he do that? Well, he used, he, he developed strategies he were, that were just very innovative um, and that actually, he actually succeeded in finding uh, price anomalies in the market. Eh? So he made most of his money with arbitrage. Eh? So he would see that something is underpriced, for example, a certain stock, uh, you have the stock, the price of the stock and you have the price of the options and he would see that actually this does not make sense. The one is overpriced, the other one is underpriced, and if I just buy a bunch of these and, tra and transfer it to there, then I just make money, for sure. Huh? <laughs> so, so that's how he made money, that's how he had such an amazing track record. And it's not that he did just that well. He was a really amazing innovator uh, in other markets too. <laughs> for example, in gambling, he was the first to, uh, 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 to, to discover uh, that you actually can beat the house in Las Vegas if you um, uh, actually if you count cards, huh? which uh, you can say is illegal. Eh? It's, it's tricking the market, but uh, you know, in investing you can count cards. Eh? Uh, so uh, in gambling, you, it's forbidden, eh? but in investing, you can. Eh? If you do mathematical calculations, that is allowed. Uh, and so what he did in the world of gambling was that he, he would count cards and um, he would also use a computer, a hidden computer, which is, of course, cheating. But he would use a hidden computer and then he would count cards, see what cards have been uh, uh, played, which cards have not been played, and then he would use the Kelly method to uh, bet more if, the, uh, if he had more advantage and bet less money if he, was not, he, if he did not have an edge. And so that way he would even be able to, to beat the casinos. Um, but of course there was cheating involved because he had a hidden computer. Eh? Uh, but uh, it does show that he... Um, uh, is a, was able to really uh, use his brain to, to beat uh, a system. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also he didn't, like, he did, the, the cheating was to hide a computer, but it's not that he exploited that. It was to prove a point uh, that he could beat the casinos. Uh, um, 
because he barely made any money of that. Huh? And he also, the moment he, he had proven that, yes, I can beat the market, he, he wrote a book about it. Uh, that was very successful uh, and that forced the casinos to change their strategies. So um, Edward Thorpe uh, later on moved on to the hedge fund world and then uh, set up this fund that was very successful. Um, and so uh, he had an amazing track record uh, thanks to actually arbitraging. Huh? But in this book there are many other managers that uh, beat the markets by um, with a lot of different techniques and um, yeah another one that's for me that for me was important but uh, I'll have to look what his name was Yeah, that is uh, Jimmy Balodinas. You can find Balodinas, Jimmy Balodinas, and uh, because the way he makes money, I found very interesting is that even when he was wrong in the market direction, he would still succeed to make money. And how he did that, he's also still alive, is um, by actually trading around his position. And it's something I've been doing also with Bitcoin past uh, half year, past year almost. So selling, so, so, so what does, does that mean? And actually I'm doing it with gold, silver now too. Uh, so it means that I'm always taking a little bit of profit. So when it goes up, I'm taking a little bit of prof profit. And then when it goes down, uh, I buy some more. Huh? And that way uh, I make more money. Uh, the only thing is you don't make as much money when the market goes parabolically up as Bitcoin did recently uh, or in, at the start of the year then because you sell some you take some profits then you have less and less Bitcoins and, and because it goes straight up you have less and less profits than if you would just have hold on to your Bitcoins eh? so that's true but you know that's the only scenario where you make more uh, I know you just don't make as much profit, but, but you still make profit because the market goes your way. But if it goes the other way down, eh, uh, and w what I do then is if it goes down, uh, uh, I will buy more. And um, if it goes up a little, I will immediately sell some, so I have a small profit. Eh? And then if it continues to go down, I make losses again, but because I made a small profit, my loss is not as big. Eh? But this uh, B Baldo, um, Jimmy Balodimas succeeded in even when it went down eh, to make enough profit so that the downward move wouldn't make, uh, would actually not become a loss, eh, but actually would still end up making a profit. Of course, this requires very intensive trading. Eh? he would be behind his computer the whole day. Huh? So um, many investors don't want to do that, of course, eh? and, and, and are long-term investors. But for me, yeah, the past half year, I've basically become a trader because, yeah, because of Bitcoin. It's so intensive that I ended up being more and more behind my computer and working more and more on my investments and indeed buying and selling a lot more these days. Uh, on a daily basis, I track prices now. Huh? Uh, and um, and when prices move, I also trade on a daily basis. Um, so, uh, but what I found also very interesting in this book, Hedge Fund um, Market Wizards, is that, yeah, the way to outperform the market, there is really not one strategy. Uh, all these hedge fund managers have different strategies and you can copy some stuff from others, but only the stuff that really fits with your personality. Huh? So all these hedge fund managers that are successful have developed their own um, way of making money. They have discovered their own stuff that it fits with them, that they are good at. Some of them made money by being long um, a market for indeed a, a decade, basically. 
and not doing that much, just buying value huh? uh, and not trading in and out a lot. Uh, others, uh, and so they go really with fundamentals. Others uh, don't give a shit basically about fundamentals and just look at the technical charts and, and, and invest based on just what goes up and what goes down. Um, um, and um, yeah, um, for example, I have been bitching about um, about technical analysis and, and, and using stop losses, uh, and uh, it's, I'm really not working that way. Yeah? So I'm doing the inverse. Yeah? So today I'm in Bitcoin and in gold and silver in my variable portfolio. But what do I do when the price goes down? I, I buy more. Whereas someone who, who, who is a trend follower and who works with stop losses, he will be stopped out and actually he will li liquidate his whole position. And as it goes down, he doesn't make any extra losses. Um, but of course, he's also out of the market when it goes up again. But when, when, when a certain um, uh, indicator is triggered, then he will enter the market again. Um, but he will have a stop loss uh, uh, where he is kicked out of the market again if it would start going down again. A few years ago, I made an article about that uh, in Dutch and a, a, an in-depth study to see if this kind of trading, this kind of investing uh, is profitable eh? to follow trends and to uh, use stop losses. Um, and my conclusion was that it was not profitable. But when after reading this book, I can see that it can be profitable for some people, but there is a lot more to it than just that. Eh? Uh, so um, yeah, some, some, some people trade that way and are successful, um, but yeah, I've also, and that's why I like the book very much, I've also discovered a lot of money managers that don't work that way and work the same way as I've been doing. Yeah? So to buy on lows basically more and uh, to sell on highs, um, but yeah, to buy, uh, sorry, let me put that differently because everyone wants to do that, but to buy as the price goes down and sell as the price goes up. Eh? That's, that's what I've been doing and uh, that's worked for me um, very well. Um, for Bitcoin, for example, since the start of the year, I'll buy Bitcoin. My return on Bitcoin is now 1,100%, uh, whereas a simple buy and hold would have earned you around... Uh, around um, uh, currently, uh, the price has gone up from $13 to currently $140. So that's 1,000% um, that a buy and hold would have given. I made a little bit more. Uh, and, of course, that, that's not remarkable. But what is remarkable is that my risk was a lot lower. And so my volatility has been a lot lower than just a buy and hold. Because just two months ago, a buy and hold Bitcoin price was at $65. And at that point, I also had around 1,000% uh, return, but the buy and hold only had seven, six to seven, 700%, 600% return. And so only two months ago, I had a lot more profit. Now it's almost the same because Bitcoin price just went up a lot. But um, uh, yeah, it's my exposure to Bitcoin was a lot lower when it was peaking out around $260 eh? and my exposure compared to a buy and hold eh? because a buy and hold I would have an exposure of around 50% then but I only had an exposure of around 30% uh, sorry no it would have been more yeah, no I'm rambling um, but yeah basically um, I've come to believe, actually, I've experienced uh, that I can make more than a permanent portfolio. And uh, I also know now that uh, actually there are considerable amount of people that succeed in that. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, of course, a profession. If you want to succeed in that, it is a profession. I don't think you will succeed in that by having investing as a hobby.
uh, only spend a few hours per week on it, I, I, think, I, I don't think you will succeed in that. Um, but if you invest a lot more time in it, I think then you can outperform the permanent portfolio. And um, yeah, that's what I've been doing. Um, and I don't think it's about luck. It is about, um, yeah, taking, basically uh, investing in things that have a higher chance of going up than of going down, uh, where the risk reward is favorable. Hmm? Um, it's a mathematical exercise. Uh, and indeed, you need to take a lot of bets uh, in order to uh, come out positively. Uh, if you only take one bet, even if the bet is favorable, you can still lose. So, so it's about um, continuing to believe, indeed, that it makes sense to bet on stuff that have a higher chance of going up than of going down. And of course, this is something that I've missed in the book, but it's actually implied. Um, they don't talk about real inflation in that book. But all these managers, they, they don't even look at a fund that makes less than 8% per year. I mean, that's really not worth investing in. That's just not worth doing it. That's, they call that a risk-free return, a return between 6 7%. They call that a risk-free return, and, uh, but they don't say how do you get that risk-free return. But the answer to that is with a permanent portfolio you get that. Eh? So if you're, if you're not able to get 6-7% per year on average, well, you can better take the permanent portfolio because it does better than what you are able to do. But indeed, a risk-free ret return, again, eh? this confirms that you don't make money with such a return. Which means, which implies that true inflation is not far from that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, estimating it's 5%. Uh, I think that's correct. And hedge funds will only charge uh, a profit. Of course, they have, they have become a lot more expensive than they used to. I think that's a big problem in the hedge fund world. They charge 2% per year management fee plus 20% of the profits. And profits means everything above six to eight percent uh, that's pr profits so yeah I think it's very hard it's equally hard to find a decent hedge fund as it is to find a decent investment and so I'm not saying here that hedge funds are the answer to your investing problems what I'm saying is that you can make a profit with investing and that is higher than the permanent portfolio returns and it's not based on luck it is based on 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 on, on um, of course, you, you need luck too. If you're unlucky, you can have a lot of qualities, but if you're unlucky, you will not succeed in that. Huh? Uh, but if you just exclude luck, if you're not lucky and not unlucky, you can make more than 8% uh, uh, per year huh? by investing very well. Huh? Um, and it's a, it's a craft, it's a, tr it's, it's, uh, it's a profession. Huh? Um, and I like the permanent portfolio a lot. I just find it a pity that a lot of these falsehoods are being promoted when the permanent portfolio is being promoted. I don't think that's necessary, and I'm guilty of that too. Uh, you know, this whole attitude that investing is not worth it, and uh, it's just look at, um, um, and, uh, and the permanent portfolio, uh, uh, you have a guaranteed, um, uh, profitable returns, <laughs> that's not possible. Eh? If you're protected in every climate, um, uh, so you have no, basically no risk or the lowest risk and you make high returns, that's just, and, and you don't have to like, uh, do anything but just d diversify over these four assets. No, it's not, that, that, how would that be profitable? That's what I've learned from this, this book again. Like a, a strategy is only profitable because little people do it. If a lot of people do it, the profit is gone because all, a lot of people are competing for the same profits. And that's exactly what's been happening with the permanent portfolio. 
if you look at my website with the long-term track records of the permanent portfolio and you compare and you also compare that with true inflation you will see that the returns of the permanent portfolio were extremely high in the 70s uh, and but have continuously dropped every decade to a, a level today that it is actually only generating 2% per year of real profit. But in the 70s, it was a lot more than that because true inflation in the 70s was around 7 8% and permanent portfolio generated around 15% per year. So you had a real return of around 7 8% in the 70s. Yeah, that's really great. But why was that great? Because in the 70s, nobody invested in gold because gold, when the permanent portfolio starts in 72, for 50 years in a row since the Great Depression, gold had the same price, which was, what was it, $32 per ounce? Into, uh, since, since 1932, that was the price, or $35 per ounce, something like that. And then it was the same price, $35 per ounce, in 1968, you know? So from 32 to 68, the gold price did not go up. But what happened with prices, consumer prices in that period, and prices of real estate, they went up a lot. Yeah, so the government was printing money, everything went up in price, but gold remained the same due to manipulation. Yeah. And, um, you know, everybody that believed in gold in the Great Depression saw their purchasing power of their gold go down, like by, I just a rough estimate here, but by more than 50%, likely by 80, 90%, yeah, from 32 to, till 1970, 68, 70, 72. Eh? You see your gold go down in purchasing power by 80, 90%. So everybody says, fuck that. Eh? And on top of that, it was even illegal to own in the United States bullion gold in that period. Eh? So you have very high risk eh, of legal problems. And the thing goes down in purchasing power like, like it, it doesn't end. So, of course, most people have given up on that and don't own any gold. So then when, 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 when the price suddenly becomes free, uh, in, what was it, 72? Suddenly, of course, gold shoots up 10 years in a row from, what was it, $32 to $800 peaking out. Yeah, and then if you have 25% of your capital in gold, yeah, you make a lot of money, of course. Uh, but that's just a, a very false representation. It's not false, but it's just not fair. It's not a fair representation eh, of the, the, the true returns of the permanent portfolio. Because first of all, it wasn't even invented in the 70s. Eh? Harry Brown invented the permanent portfolio in the 80s, eh? starting in the 80s. And um, so if you start counting from that period, the return is not that 15%, if you just include, exclude the 70s, you look at the 80s, then you can see that the, the, the return was uh, in the 80s around 9% per year on average. But then you can just go, see it going down, down, down. In the 90s it was less, in the new decade it was even less. Eh? Like it goes from 10% on average or 9% uh, to 8% in the 90s, 7% uh, in the new decade. And, and today it's around 6, 7%. So it goes down every decade with 1%, but true inflation is not going down. Eh? So, so, so what you can see is that real returns of the permanent portfolio are going down, which is normal because the strategy is being exploited by more and more people. Eh? So if you want to make real money, you need an edge. You need to do something that's original, eh? that other people do not do, and then you will make money. And otherwise you won't. And the permanent portfolio succeeds in, purchasing your, uh, in preserving your purchasing power. And that will probably be the case for another decade, two decades. And because currently you make a profit of 2% per year. I think this will go down. And in one decade, we will see, maximum two decades, we will see that actually after deducting true inflation, you don't make 2% per year anymore, you make 0%, huh? which is still 
preserving your purchasing power, but it's not making any money. So, yeah, you really are forced, the longer it takes, I mean, if you want to make profit after uh, real, real, real inflation, you are forced to do something original with your money, to, do, uh, to use your brains, e either by looking for investments yourself or use your brains by looking for uh, managers that are using their brains to make money in the market. Mm -hmm. But for both exercises, you will need to use your brains. Right? So, um, yeah, that's how it works. Um, and that's what I'm doing. Yeah? Um, and it's in light of that, yeah? I haven't decided to give up these long-term bonds. I made a video about that in the permanent portfolio. Um, I think the way I will do it is I will build it off gradually. Huh? So if the long-term bonds, I really like the idea of the PP3, huh? the permanent portfolio, but with only three assets. Um, I think it will give you an edge the coming 10, 20 years. Um, it's not based on historical track record, huh? um, uh, because that's just not possible. You see, every successful strategy in the past will become a failure in the future. Yeah. It's also true for companies. You know, if you build a company, yeah. you, you, every successful company today used a certain strategy to become successful. But if they continue to use the same strategy, they will go broke. Yeah. A company continuously needs to change strategies to, to find an edge in the market where ca they can ask money, because if they do the same, you get just more competitors, and they also start to do the same. You know, look at Apple, makes great uh, uh, phones eh? uh, and other stuff. They can ask a high profit margin, so they are a great company now, make great profits, but people start copying them. Eh? You have Samsung coming up, offering the same for a sh uh, cheaper price. And, um, and, and so if Apple does not continue to innovate, eh, um, do something new, uh, they will go broke in the end. That's how it works. Eh? Uh, just like uh, all Kodak went broke recently, being, having been the biggest company. Nokia is very close to being broke. Only one decade ago, they were the biggest telecom company in the world. So uh, these things change continuously, and it's the same in the investment world. And um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and today I'm making money uh, in the investment world also thanks to an innovation, which is Bitcoin. Um, I have an edge there uh, because money managers most of them will not touch it eh? uh, because it has a lot of risk. Eh? Uh, it's too small in market capitalization for them to even bother eh? because most successful money managers have a lot of capital to manage. So they, they really need instruments that have a large market cap because it's only like market cap one, two billion. So a money manager, a successful management manager, he, he has many billions to invest. So let's say you say, okay, I'm going to take a small allocation, let's say 100 million. Well, I will push the price up immediately. Uh, so that's one problem. The second problem is, well, it's, there, is no, there, is our legal, there is no legal certainty. It's possible that one day the government is going to uh, attack Bitcoin and people that invest in it with a high profile could be under attack. Uh, so, is it worth the, the risk for these people? You know, they are successful already. Why? They have a lot more at risk than most people that invest in Bitcoin today. They start from nothing. Yeah? They have a less at risk. Yeah? So, it makes more economical sense for them to do that, huh? to take that risk. Huh? Um, so, that's another edge huh? that you have in Bitcoin. Um, and of course, yeah, there is also an edge in, uh, you know, technology. Yeah? Um, most money managers are good in managing money, but are not experts in 
in, 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 in uh, computer technology. And so it's not user friendly today, Bitcoin. Uh, so it, pay, it actually takes a lot of knowledge before you can invest in it. And you need a lot of knowledge, not only technical knowledge to actually buy and the Bitcoin, store them safely so that they are not being stolen by hackers. Eh? Um, but you already have third party solutions that will do that for you. You have a hedge fund, uh, sorry, yeah, a hedge fund. Is it in, uh, I don't know the country, somewhere in Southern Europe that invests exclusively in Bitcoin, they will also store it safely for you. So people that have money can use that instrument, but you also need a lot of knowledge before you can invest with confidence in Bitcoin, because you really need to understand something about money and about economy. Eh? And um, it's quite a leap uh, to believe that um, uh, something like Bitcoin can become an important currency. Eh? It's not backed by anything. You can say it's backed by cryptography, but that's not backing, that's technology. It basically, it's not backed by any commodity, uh, and so, uh, and you have to trust that it cannot be uh, created more bitcoins, that it cannot be fraudulent. So you need to understand something about wh why is it that it cannot be printed more, huh? and yeah, wh why would it continue to expand? Uh, yeah. Like for example, I found it interesting the way Bill Gates and Warren Buffett responded to the question, what do you think of uh, Bitcoin? I found that very interesting. And so Bill, uh, Warren Buffett uh, answered first and his, his colleague, uh, what is his name, Munger or something. Um, uh, so Warren Buffett has a colleague uh, that also manages the investments and Munger said that it was rat poison and really like it's rat poison. He was really, he found it really crap. Huh? Um, he seemed even pissed about it. And, uh, and, then, um, and then they asked Bill Gates, what do you think about it? And Bill Gates said, uh, I think it's a techno tour de force. Huh? Techno tour de force. Um, but he said, I think governments will remain dominant in that area. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I found that very interesting. This has given me a lot of courage, actually, to continue to invest in Bitcoin because I could not have dreamt that only one year ago that Bill Gates would say something about that, about Bit that would even Bill Gates would even see Bitcoin already this year and that he would even have has formed an opinion on it and that he would have formed an opinion on it that is actually equally strong as the one I had. Like techno tour de force, it means a tour de force, that means it's, it's, it's something that you end up creating that you will probably, n of such a quality, that you will probably never repeat. Eh? Uh, they say a tour de force, that's, that's the meaning of it. Eh? It's really an exceptional performance that you will probably not repeat. And he calls it the techno to the force. So he, he's saying it's, it's an incredible performance uh, achievement uh, in the field of technology. Huh? Um, and so he's really recognizing himself and validating that indeed Bitcoin is an amazing uh, innovation. Huh? But at the same time, that his next sentence is that, but I think the government will remain dominant in that area, meaning he thinks it will not succeed due to the government. Hmm? That's my interpretation. Um, and that's, I think, the reason why the market cap is only one, two billion. Because people like Bill Gates, they are not investing in that yet. Huh? Because they are doubtful whether the government will allow this to happen or not. And um, yeah, the market cap is too small also for them to invest in it. So. They are still watching. Um, and, uh, yeah, but it's clear, it's really, it's really provoking a lot of hard 
feelings, like the way this Munger, resp and then Warren Buffett said, my opinion is somewhere in between. He said something like that, between Bill Gates and, and his colleague Munger. Um, so he didn't really say anything about it. But it's clear that they had talked about it. Uh, and it's clear that, um, yeah, there are strong feelings about that. Huh? And I think that's also a good sign. Um, yeah, because it's, it's true. It is a world-changing event, or at least it, could, it can be. Yeah? So, so it's, it's seeing people going heavily against it, um, yeah, means that, uh, yeah, they realize that this could, uh, could have a serious impact. Yeah? And, um, yeah. So, um, I think I've said it all. Um, I really advise that book, uh, Hedge Fund uh, uh, Market Wizards, because it's interviews uh, with uh, 20 hedge fund managers. Uh, and um, you, what I've learned from it, that there's really no, not one way. And I've made that mistake. I'm, uh, like I, I've just made uh, another promo talk about Bitcoin. But you really don't need Bitcoin to succeed in investing. There are so many ways. Uh, to, to succeed in investing. There are so many interesting, well, not many, but there are, every, there are a lot of interesting investments to be found and a lot of different strategies to follow to profit from that. Eh? Uh, and um, yeah, it's, uh, um, yeah, I highly encourage uh, anyone to do that if they are interested to do that. Um, thanks a lot for watching. Bye.